Hello, everyone. Uh, how are you doing? I hope you are having a great day wherever you are. Thank you very much for joining us on today's Local Search Clinic. Um, I'm delighted to be joined uh, by Dana T. Tommaso, who is president and partner uh, of Kickpoint, an agency uh, in, is it in Edmonton? Yes, Edmonton, mm -hmm. Alberta, Canada. Uh, okay, so the first question, Dana, <coughs> uh, which came from um, uh, Phil Roher. Hopefully I've pronounced that correctly, Phil. Uh, Phil's company has um, hundreds of locations across the US. Uh, each has a location web page on their website. What he's noticed is that in some uh, cities uh, where maybe there's um, a kind of overlapping locations or multiple locations um, in, a, in a city, a city um, that one location maybe outranks others uh, and gets a lot more visibility whereas the other locations uh, are not getting their fair share of visibility, uh, or possibly um, you know, one is a kind of dominant location is outperforming in the zip codes that another location exists within, and therefore there's not a kind of equitable share of visibility uh, mm -hmm. and, uh, and traffic. Um, and it doesn't appear to be kind of linked to the proximity of search yet. So Phil's question is, you know, what recommendations have you got so that either, I guess, more clinics can show, or the actually the right, most appropriate, closest clinic ends up appearing. This is kind of geared towards organic search rather than uh, rather than GMB. Yeah, so I mean, my question back would be, how are you tracking this? Because that's one of the things I'm wondering is, you know, how do you know that Google is showing that? Are you looking at, say, Google My Business views, which aren't super accurate? Um, and, and that's what I would want to know is, you know, how is he telling that those are the ones that are showing up? Is he using rank tracking, for example? If he's using rank tracking and he's seeing a consistent issue where the other clinics just aren't showing up, then I would look for commonalities between the clinics that are dominating and seeing if there's something that they all have in common. Like, do they have a lot more reviews than the other clinics, for example? Do they have more links leading to them? Do they, have they been open the longest, right? And particularly for things like when they have been open for a long time, that can be really tricky because Google might just be showing it, you know, just because Google's used to, you know, Google has that, uh, I would call it almost an age filter. You know, the oldest business sometimes wins. And so if you started with one clinic in a city and that's the one that got all the press for a long time and then you open five more, it's tough to, to tell Google, hey, by the way, don't forget about these other places. Um, I would also take a look too at branding and see if there's something where if people search for that one clinic, is that the place that is coming up first? You know, if you have say a page for that city, and all the clinics are listed on it, is that the first clinic on the list? Like, could it be something as simple as that? Like really start to break down what are the common factors that are making these clinics rank better than the others? Um, I also, so we did Local U a couple weeks ago. And one of the things I talked about at Local U in particular when it comes to Google My Business and those view stats you get in the GMB interface is the idea of a, what I call a landmark business. And those are the businesses that just show up on the map when you are just looking at the city without um, actually searching for anything yet. So you get always usually get like, you know, here's the mall and here's a convention center and those sorts of things. So I would wonder if maybe those clinics are also landmark businesses and the views are just showing up to make it look like that location is great when it's reality is just Google's just showing it just because that's part of its stock uh, set of things that it shows when you open up Google Maps. Um, so I would start looking in all those different places. And I'd be curious to have some follow-ups as well to, to find out the answers to some of these questions that I have back for him. And in terms of, uh, I think a lot of this question is kind of geared towards being or kind of organic ranking as well. Mm -hmm. And I guess if we if we assume that the kind of site structure is fairly um, equitable, you know, same hierarchy, you've got location page, regional page, you know, leading up to sort of home page. Um, you know, how much of a factor do you think like internal linking and external linking could be for that? Oh, I think internal linking would be a huge problem. And that's why I'm thinking if you do have a, say, a page for the city, you know, does, are these locations first on that list? You know, could it be something as simple as that? Um, do you have maybe like one external link that is tipping the favor in terms of that one location page? You know, maybe they got a media mention and none of the other locations did. So now Google thinks that that location is the winner at all times. You know, so those are the kinds of things that I would I would be considering is just what is it? And then I would also crawl the site as Google as much as you possibly can, like really do a technical audit. Because the other thing too, sometimes, for example, if one of the, some of these map layouts aren't necessarily great from a technical SEO perspective, a lot of them are very JavaScript driven and can give weird results. And so if, for example, you try to crawl the site um, and you could use, for example, deep crawl with the JavaScript crawler turned on to give that a shot and see is Google always coming up with that page faster than the other pages, for example, because maybe it is first in the list or whatever it might be. And that's why Google can't actually get to those other pages or aren't seeing those pages as much um, as that as those main locations that are always coming up again and again. 
Interesting. Okay. And in terms of other local signals, so let's say you've got you know a number of locations in the sort of same city. How how much would you look at you know I guess sort of hyper local signals that you could create for each location so that Google clearly understands the specific kind of geography and catchment area. Yeah, I would try things like um, if you do have reviews that mention the neighborhood, for example, where that location is in, try to embed those reviews, for example, on that location's website. Really look at the content that you have on each of those location pages. Because the thing is, too, is is if you have, let, let's say, Chicago, for example, right? So let's say that it is a physiotherapy clinic in Chicago. And so your one location says, you know, Chicago, Chicago, Chicago all the time. But then your other location says, you know, South Side, for example, right? Or North Side. And so because these other locations have more specific geographic mentions, Google's thinking, well, they're not as important, say, for Chicago. And this is sort of the flaws in the algorithm. Like, it is just a computer, and it's not necessarily the brightest computer. And sometimes, unless you're very, very clear and spell out exactly what it is that you're trying to rank for, Google's not going to be able to figure it out. So really look at that language that you have on those individual pages as well. And yeah, if you do have any reviews at all that mention the neighborhoods or the specific locations where these, mm. where these uh, locations are in, make sure to embed those on those individual location pages as well. Okay, interesting. And um, okay, fine. And if you were, if you had this sort of problem that uh, the sort of field's got, how would you tackle it in terms of diagnosing it and 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 kind of testing maybe in one in, in one area to kind of I guess produce a blueprint for for what other, you know how you would sort of roll that that um, uh, out to other areas that are other clinics that are struggling other locations. Yeah, I, personally, I would start with the technical audit because I would think that if, particularly for the organic search thing, I would think that Google is probably grabbing that first location for some reason and then ignoring the rest. So I would look at what's going on with the indexing of the site to see if there's something obvious there. Um, and then I might try maybe reordering without seeing the page is hard, but you know, see if that location is first on the page. So for the Chicago page, you've got here are six locations in Chicago. Is that the first one? You know, it, it could be something silly like that. Is there something different in the title tags of that page? Is there something different in the content of that page? Like really try to eliminate, think about it from a scientific method perspective. Um, and just try to eliminate variables until you're left with what could possibly be different. Um, and and again, like just try stuff on that one location. So pick one city out of the many, it sounds like, where you're having this problem, and then try lots of different stuff in that city until you're seeing what's working, and then you can roll that out across other cities. Okay, brilliant. Okay, thanks, Dana. That was a, a really uh, a really good kind of clear answer, lots of detail. Uh, let's go to the next question. Um, um, this comes from uh, Hope Flamer. Uh, I'm working with a doctor. Uh, and the doctor works out of two different offices in neighboring cities, uh, San Francisco and Oakland. Uh, the doctor actually has two physical locations uh, with two GMB listings, but only one number. Um, you know, I guess, you know, it, the question is any tips, but I guess if, if her objective is to ensure that both locations um, really perform well in each of their individual uh, sort of cities, um, mm -hmm. you know, what should she be doing to kind of, I guess, really differentiate the two but also, you know, um, drive up the kind of optimization for the two. Yeah, I would buy a second phone number for the other location. It can be a tracking number. Um, we have a client, for example, who right now they're operating their business off their cell phones. Eventually they will have an actual office with phone lines. But in the meantime, we just got them a number in call rail and that is their phone number for their business. So you could just get one tracking number that all it does is redirect to or, or indicate that this is the Oakland location, for example. So maybe the phone number that you use right now is for San Francisco, get a second phone number for Oakland. I can't remember if there's different area codes or whatnot between the two, but try to make it as local as possible. And then just have that as the number for Oakland, even though it's technically a tracking number, like it's just a second phone number. And that way you're not worrying about having one location with two numbers. I mean, I know Google doesn't necessarily do the merging so much anymore than they used to, where if you had two two different listings with one single phone number, they'd end up with some sort of weird amalgam of the two. That doesn't happen as much, but I still worry about it. Um, and I think that that's important. And then really make sure on your website that you have two location pages, one for each location. Um, and actually, you mentioned before we went live, you know, for this particular question, like maybe they have different service hours, for example, at each location, because obviously the doctor can't be in two places mm -hmm. at once. So making sure that those different location pages have those hours, make sure to include a schema markup. And yeah, and Trisha just mentioned in chat, would they both answer on the same phone? Yes, yes, they would. So what you would do is buy one tracking number or you can buy two, but it, they both forward to the same phone. 
So reality at your end, there's really no difference to how you answer phone calls now. You just have a separate phone number for uh, Google My Business and office separation purposes. I guess in terms of that kind of question around both leading through the phone, same phone and being answered, um, you know, I guess Google kind of talks about having to need to have kind of clarity in terms of the, the business name that you use should match essentially the way you answer the phone call. You know, so if you're mm -hmm. going in San Francisco and actually someone's calling from Oakland, but obviously one, it creates confusion for the individual, but also kind of creates confusion for, for Google might be deemed as a, as a spammy listing. And yeah, but in that case, like trust. that's where I would use um, the whisper messaging that you have in CallRail because in CallRail, you can set it up so that a thing called a whisper message can, so you pick up the phone and then a robotic voice will say, calling from Oakland, for example, and then you know it's a person who called the Oakland number. Oh, okay. um, and so if you don't get that whisper message or maybe you do two phone numbers, it depends on how I would, stick with the original number in the clinic that's more well established and use the call tracking number for the second location. But then, you know, if you don't have a whisper message, for example, then they're calling the original San Francisco number, for example. I've got a question for you, which kind of leads on to this, and hopefully that answers it for Flame. And sometimes you get a scenario where you've got a, a physician, uh, you know, a doctor who is assigned to two or three clinics, or it could be a physiotherapist who works at two or three places. How do you handle that when they, they might be on a Monday, they might be in one clinic on one side of town. They might, you know, be working somewhere else on a Tuesday and Wednesday. How do you manage that from, a, from a, I guess, a GMB point of view? Yeah, I mean, they should have a practitioner listing, obviously, because they are, a, they would qualify for the practitioner. And in that case, I think it's where you can put it, to say, in the business description, where you're physically working. Um, you could also, this could be a good example of Google My Business posts, say, like, today I'm at this clinic, for example. Um, I think that Google really does need to expand their ability and sort of understanding of what a practitioner listing is, because right now it is kind of limited to say physicians, doctors, et cetera. But in reality, it's things like um, uh, what Greg Gifford mentioned, a great example, tattoo artists, for example, who work out of multiple tattoo shops, like they yeah. are practitioners too. Hairstylists, you know, fitness instructors, yeah. for example, like I know, for example, that one of my boxing instructors is also a spin instructor. Why shouldn't she have a practitioner listing? Because people will want to come to her classes specifically. So it's really no different than a doctor. And I hope that Google My Business will think about expanding that ability of practitioner listing. So in the meantime, you really just have to be creative. And but would you would you get to choose just what would you choose a to create a practice at one clinic or just create one for all the clinics and then just set the opening hours based on you know when you're when you're physically there? I would set the opening hours based on when you're physically there. Um, I think and then indicate. Yeah, I mean, you'd have to put in your description or your posts or something like this is where I am. I just mm. I think that practitioner listings aren't super great right now because it does think you know, you're a practitioner, you're tied to this one location when in reality, that isn't necessarily the case. And you don't want to change your address every day. Right. So, yeah, I mean, it's the practitioner listings aren't perfect right now, but I think that that's where you, and especially if you are a practitioner, like take control of that listing, because one of the places you go to could go out of business. And so people want to still find you. Yeah. But you wouldn't think they should have a practitioner listing for each of the individual. If these clinics they work at are entirely separate. I, I'd have to look at the rules. I don't know if you're allowed to do that, actually, because I think that would count as a duplicate listing. Um, I would have to take a look. Actually, I would have to refresh my memory on the practitioner listings and take a look at that. Yeah, it's an interesting one because I guess if you're, you know, if you're just putting I'm here Monday and not here any other day, and then Tuesday, Wednesday, you're giving a yeah. true reflection of where you are, really, aren't you? Uh, which is mm -hmm. kind of what Google Google wants to uh, wants to represent. Uh, but it's yeah. interesting the way that you write. There are, you know, there are professions that will do move around and, and work in different places. Maybe Google isn't isn't truly reflecting that. No. Um, okay. I great. Well, like, there's a lot of limitations in GMB because of that. I don't think a lot of the GMB stuff. It's not. I don't want to slam on the GMB team, but I feel like a lot of the times they're not really thinking about what happens in reality when it comes to these types of businesses um, and what qualifies and what doesn't. And I get it's difficult to think about every possible business permutation around the world, but something basic like temporarily closed is something that we've been asking for for years. And now we have it because of a global pandemic. You know, I really wish yeah. we had it before the global pandemic. So I think it's stuff like that where we really just have to push GMB to understand the reality of our clients' situations and hopefully they will make these changes sooner. Uh, anyway, Flame says thank, uh, says thank you very much. For, so Hope says thank you very much for, uh, for answering that. That's great. Uh, okay, uh, next question comes from Ryan. Uh, he says, um, I have a client uh, who uh, is a painting business, paints locally in our city, uh, but his company address is actually in a different city. Um, but he does, it sounds like he does a lot of his work in the adjacent city to where I guess his location is. Um, all the citations are from the other city. Um, you, know, what, you know, if you had a client, like this Dana, 
um, you know, what, what advice would you give to ensure that they um, are as visible as possible across all their kind of catchment area? Yeah, I mean, my first question is, are you actually going to be building citations? Like, is does this painter actually have a physical place where people could come to? Because if they're just working out of their house and their truck, then I wouldn't have a listing for them anyway that involves citations because that's their service area business, right? Um, so that's my first question for Ryan. And I think I see him in the chat. So Ryan, if you're listening, if you let me know. Um, and then the other thing too, is really when you're thinking about citations, obviously citations are just, they're, they aren't gonna be the thing that makes you rank, right? Citations are just the table stakes that get you in the game. So I think at this point you need to think about what can I do to make sure that people understand that I work in this area. So really Ryan should be, the, this painter should be a surface area business um, and they should make sure to have posts and examples on their website of painting jobs that they've done in insert city name here, right? And I think that that's the biggest thing. Yeah, so they don't actually use that address for business. So in that case, Ryan, don't worry about citations. Think about them as a service area business. Um, I know that there are some citations you can build as a service area business, so do those. And this is the, you know, let's say for example, they're located in, in uh, thinking about Toronto. So they are, live in Mississauga, but they actually serve in Toronto, for example. And in that case, you know, there are some citations you can say that yes, if we have a painting service in Toronto, like Homestars, for example, would be a good place where you could still build a citation for that or a uh, house. So in that case, what you really need to focus on are portfolio pieces. Get good photos, and you're gonna, probably gonna have to talk to the client and educate them on what makes a good photo versus a horrible photo. And make sure that they take the time to take the photos and then create portfolio pieces on their website saying, here's a painting job I did in Hyde Park in Toronto, for example. Or here's a painting job I did in Roncevalles. Or you know, like think about the different neighborhoods in that city that you could talk about where you did a painting job. And I think that's really gonna make the difference in terms of ranking because that's gonna show that local authority. Um, service area businesses in general, difficult to rank. Um, so I think really the only way you're gonna be able to get out there is by thinking outside of that local pack. And that means thinking past citations. Yeah, I mean, there are obviously a number of citations you can build where you are able to to hide your address. And I'll ask Jamie or um, Steph from our team to to share a link. We put together a fairly uh, general list of sites that that enable you to hide your address to to kind of some degree, which which kind of might prove useful. Um, how would you go around within, I guess, in GMB in terms of setting the, I guess, two things: one, setting the service area. Mm -hmm. um, for the business, but also, I guess, also setting the client's expectation in terms of what they could hope to achieve, uh, let's say, within yeah. kind of GMB performance. Yeah, I always try to find good examples in other areas that I can show them and say, you know, in a perfect world, this is what you can expect to see. And I actually show them what a service area business looks like. I explain how service area businesses don't rank, you know, really talking about it. and also showing their competitors, too. If they have competitors who are also service area businesses, um, that's helpful, but sometimes too, it's really interesting because you'll show competitors and like, oh, I know that guy works out of his house. Okay, great. Then we're going to report them. You know, so that's the other half of local SEO as well is that reporting people breaking the rules often can be just as successful as actually doing SEO work, which is a horrible state of the industry. But here we are. Um, sometimes you got to rat on people to get stuff to rank. And so don't be afraid to do that as well. Sometimes it's really useful too, especially in these industries where everybody knows everybody to take them on a tour of Google Maps and say, tell us, you know, is this actually where they're located? And they'll say things like, oh, this, this guy doesn't have five offices. What is this? This is really spammy, you know? And then you can report all those and hopefully rank a little bit better as well. Um, and that's particularly if you are working with clients who aren't physically where you are. So for example, we work with clients, say our client in Australia, you know, we'll open up maps and say, you know, show us on the map, like where, for example, you know, here's a competitor. Are they physically in that address? Do you mind driving by and taking a look and see if they actually have an office in this building, for example, or are they just faking it? Um, and that sort of thing can be really useful to help uh, stamp down spam too. Yeah, interesting. Okay, thanks, Dana. All right, uh, let's go back to uh, the kind of question section again. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, hopefully Ron answers your question. Next question comes from uh, Online Access. Uh, it says, uh, what's your recommendation for businesses um, that try to be everything for everybody, i.e. they serve, you know, or they have four or five different kind of verticals within within the sort of business. So let's say um, the client is, a, is an HVAC contractor, there's also an electrician, a plumber, refrigeration company, and a construction business. So a pretty yeah. broad set of offerings that are actually very distinctive in terms of like GMB categorization. Yeah. And the question actually, their question is more about kind of organic optimization. Um, you know, what would be your, 
sort of plan of attack for a business like this to try and get them business, you know, across as many of those verticals that they, they serve? We actually have a client who is exactly like this, except the only thing they don't do out of all the different stuff you listed is construction. So they do HVAC. HVAC is their primary thing. And then they also do plumbing and electrical. So I think the first thing you would ask them is rank the different services you offer. And if you could only market three of them, what would you what would you do if you couldn't rank all of them? And if the client's like, well, I need to rank all of them, that's just how it is, then I mean, that's like a red flag in that client relationship that you're not going to make them super happy. Um, and then you really have to work hard on the stuff that they are not going to rank easily for. So check what they're ranking for now. Like, for example, for our client um, in HVAC, they actually have heating and cooling in their business name. So it's way easier for us to rank them for things like HVAC, which means we have to spend extra time working on, say, plumbing and electrical. So that helps you define, you know, I have to spend extra time working on electrical content. I have to spend extra time working on plumbing content. I have to really push the client to make sure to get reviews for electrical and reviews for plumbing. And this is where, for example, again, embedding reviews where people talk specifically about that service, not just we worked with so-and-so and they were awesome, but you know, so-and-so came by and fixed our home electrical system. We were quoted $8 billion by another vendor and they came by and did it for $3 They're the best I'm gonna tell our old friends. Those kinds of reviews, those are the ones you wanna embed specifically on those electrical pages. And if they mention where they're physically located, even better. Um, and that's the kind of work that you need to do is really prioritize and getting those pages working well. Um, and it also depends, you didn't say whether or not they um, have multiple locations or not, but if you think about, you know, for example, do you need to make a location page for every single, you know, electrical in city, electrical in city, you don't need to do that anymore. You can just say that they serve all these different areas um, and they do you know, one page for electrical and mention all the places that they serve. But that's also something to consider as well as making sure that you've got lots of content and content is really what's going to help you in this kind of situation. Um, and also in particular for things like HVAC, um, right now is actually a really good opportunity to talk to people. For example, maybe your team isn't comfortable going into people's houses right now, which is fair and in some areas you're not allowed to, um, and start to do things like videos on what people can do in their houses themselves if they're having problems with their hot water tank is acting up, or if they, you know, do you actually need to get your ducts cleaned? Is that gonna help with things like respiratory illnesses? Like start working on that video content because if you're just sitting around waiting for people to call you once all this is over, You've got that time to make that content, and that's going to be really great stuff to add to your page to help with the organic ranking later on. You, you mentioned about running some very exciting uh, electrical and plumbing content. Um, what is your kind of ideation process for um, writing stuff that's, let's say, beyond landing page type content? You know, where where yeah. where do you kind of go to? Where do you find it is the richest sort of vein of opportunity for writing around topics such as this, which you know you may think actually there's not much to write about, but actually. You, you can go quite far once you unearth, you know, new, new paths of creativity. Yeah, I would start by Googling stuff, honestly, and then go to the bottom and look at the people also search for and just start diving in, add whys and whats and wheres, uh, look at your own Google search console data and see what sorts of questions, maybe rank number, you know, 148, that doesn't matter. It's a question that somebody had. See what kinds of things Google is suggesting and type ahead, you know, type ahead search is still a rich source of questions. And also look at um, people also ask. Uh, a lot of the content that we end up recommending that clients write is based on the people also ask questions that come up and thinking, you know, okay, so you tell me in 10 minutes, why do I need to worry about this or what does this mean? Um, and then that's a good video, for example, for someone. And what's your intention then? And what's your kind of hope? If you're looking at the, the people, uh, if people always ask or other, other kind of questions, mm -hmm. is it you're hoping that your, your, the post will be included, you know, within those additional kind of questions or maybe get the feature snippet? Or is it you just going, okay, this is where the volume of searches is happening. Therefore, content around this is good. It's, I would say it's both of those things. We're, we are hoping long term to eventually get the snippet. And there is definitely some local intent when it comes to which snippet Google's choosing. You can see it a lot for things like medical queries, for example. You'll get the local medical authority if they have a page on that topic. So if I'm in England and I Google something, I'm going to get NHS. If I'm in Canada, I'm going to get Health Canada, right? If they have different, if they have different pages about that. In the States, yeah. you'll probably get WebND or Mayo Clinic, for example. So I think it's important to consider that when it comes to those types of local searches. I don't think Google's super great at it yet, but there's nothing stopping you from making it now for when Google does get better at it in the future. 
Um, and then the other half of it too is thinking about it from a user experience standpoint, right? The more you can demonstrate your expertise in a topic, the more people are gonna feel comfortable calling you, particularly when it's a come into my house and do an expensive thing that could really screw stuff up if you do it wrong. And the more you can write about a topic, the more you can demonstrate that authoritativeness, the more people are gonna contact you. So it is really helpful from a conversion standpoint as well. Okay, great. Um, just noticed that in the, the kind of chat stream that Claire had a question looping back over the previous conversation. Um, the service areas fields in GMB, can you clarify how G uh, Google uses this data for a pure SAB versus let's say a bricks and mortar business? How does Google utilize that? How does it impact ranking? And what differences do you think they exist between how it uses that for SABs versus physical businesses? Oh, Claire, always asking the tough questions. Um, <laughs> I'm not 100% sure how Google uses it, to be honest. I A lot of this is experimentation. So especially because in service areas, you used to be able to list, for example, if we had a client who served 100 zip codes, we would put 100 zip codes in there, and now you can only put 20. So it does make me think that Google is being very specific, and they are considering ranking when it comes to that. Only in maps, of course, this won't affect organic. Um, uh, and then for bricks and mortar, I think it's less important but I think that it is something that Google is taking into consideration as well. I mean, this is something for sure where uh, I would love to see testing on the topic if we could get some large scale data sets and see mm -hmm. how, for example, adding in one new area in people's service area businesses, does it actually impact their ranking in that area? It's something that, you know, I think Joy Hawkins, for example, would be a good person to do this kind of testing because she would have access to enough profiles to give that a shot. Um, but yeah, I would say that, you know, and, and the other question often that we even have for ourselves is, you know, in that service area fields, what do we put? Is it a zip code? Is it a city name? Is it a county name? In Canada, we have really long postal codes. And there, so for example, like T5B1L9 and like every six houses has a separate postal code. So then do we put the first three parts, just the T5B part in there? Because Google does understand that, but it doesn't understand it as much as saying like Edmonton, for example, right? So it's really tricky and it's, there's a lot of experimentation, I find, with that area until you're settled down with something that you're happy with. Do you, do you get a sense that they they kind of upweight the the kind of the kind of or prioritize the kind of the, the sort of first service areas that you put in, um, or do you think they give an equal weighting across all of the ones? That you I put think in? I don't know. I haven't actually tested that. That's yeah. a good question. I yeah. mean, manually we often do start with the most important service areas, so I mean we're probably biasing ourselves towards the answer to say yes, it's the most important ones. But mm -hmm. yeah, that's a great question. I don't actually know the answer to that. Okay. All right. Well, maybe we can uh, we can work on the uh, on some of those uh, some of those tests as well. Mm -hmm. we'll uh, we've actually got Joy joining us on a on a, a local clinic coming out. So yeah. hit uh, her up in advance for her to something. try that. I'd be really yeah, yeah. would say. <laughs> yeah. So so would I definitely. Uh, mm -hmm. Okay. Um, right. Let's go. Uh, next question down. Um, okay. This one uh, again. Um, so use it for online access. Um, what are what is some of your favorite uh, local search tools? So I guess let's um. You know, I guess if it's narrowed this down, what, what are the five tools that you uh, you tend to kind of use or recommend? Uh, well, you know, Bright Local is one of the tools we recommend for clients. I think that <laughs> uh, White Spark is another one. Uh, Places Scout um, is another one. And then I'm thinking, um, if you do have a larger business, Stat Search Analytics does excellent rank ranking for huge businesses. So if you are like lots and lots of locations, I would recommend looking at them for sure. Um, yeah, I, I'm sure I'm forgetting somebody. There's Moz Local as well uh, as another tool that we've used in the past. We actually don't use a lot of tools, to be honest. Um, for review management, we use GatherUp a lot of the time. Uh, that's one of our favorite if you need just review type vendors. Um, and then for posting to Google My Business posts, uh, you can't use Buffer, uh, unfortunately, for anything like that. So there's one that we use that I always forget the name of. And of course, I've forgotten the name of it again. I will try to remember. Liz, if you're listening, send me a Slack chat on what is the name of the tool is. <laughs> so yeah, you, I think you, have a, you, you have a range of tools that you, you pick and choose from oh, yeah. depending on the, the needs and nature yeah. of the sort of the, the, the piece how you're working we're on. Concerned. Yeah, and we, the way we work with our clients is we try to be really educational. Publer, thanks, Liz. <laughs> so Publer is the tool that we use for posting to Google, Google Posts. Um, I would find that a lot of the times it's us saying to the client, like, this is what you need long term. Like, this is the tool we're using for you, for example. So you're working with us, you know, we're going to use WhiteSpark to build citations, for example. You know, long term, you should consider monitoring the stuff on here, or here's a dashboard we've built you, and it pulls in. Uh, um, pulls in data from these six different sources, right? 
And for in-house teams, you know, that's where we would say something like Bright, Lo Bright Local, for example, like here's a tool that's gonna do multiple things for you. So we think we should get you set up on this. We never white label, we always just get the client into the tool. Sometimes they're paying for it themselves, for example, um, because mm -hmm. realistically, and it's just our business model is we educate you. We don't necessarily want you to pay us every month forever if you don't need to. Um, and particularly for a lot of local SEO stuff, yes, there's the monitoring, but a lot of the day-to-day -day stuff is not necessarily like rocket science. And if the client has an in-house team, like we can teach them how to do it. And then they use the tools like, you know, Whitespark and Bright Local and others where they can actually keep on top of stuff on a daily basis. Okay, so you're, you have a very kind of open policy then, because I know some agencies yeah. like to kind of keep things sort of, you know, kind of on the download in terms of what yep. they admit that they use. Uh, but you have a very open policy. I guess obviously the value add is kind of beyond the tool. It's the training, it's the support, it's the yeah. it's just the ability to actually kind of deliver the work, um, which is I guess yeah. where the the real value lies. Uh, well, okay, and, thanks. And uh, clients, sometimes clients too, just related to this, will come to us with a tool that they're already using, but they're not using it to its fullest potential. So it's a matter too of saying okay. like, is this still a good tool for you? Yes, you just need to learn about X, Y, and Z. And I think that that's an important thing too for clients is just to get better at the tools they're already paying for. Okay, great. Uh, thanks, Dana. Okay, uh, next question uh, comes from uh, a very good friend of Bright Local called Greg. Um, will adding SEO tags and schema data directly uh, into the metadata area of an image before uploading it to GMB um, mm -hmm. have any positive effect on search visibility um, for, I guess, that GMB, but specifically when people are searching from that location? I don't know. Try it. No. <laughs> Let me know how it goes. Uh, yeah, I don't know. That's an interesting question. I don't know the answer to that, to be honest. It's not yeah. something that I have personally tried. Um, I feel like that's where, I feel like those kinds of tactics are where you're like, what is the thing that I can do to move us 1%? Because I've done absolutely everything else I can for mm -hmm. this business. Yeah. I don't know if that's going to be the thing that like rockets you from position 50 to position two. Right. So yeah, no, it's not something that we've tried. That's a yeah, good idea. I, I, think, I think I agree with you. When I kind of look at it, I think, okay, you know, Google's looking to get the business to provide signals about their location. Uh, and Google has given you some obvious places where you can clearly tell Google where you're located and what you do. Kind of mm -hmm. almost kind of going into the radar and sort of seeding your images with this additional location data. You think yeah. if Google's, you know, if, if Google doesn't already know exactly where you're located based on all the tools it's given you, then yeah. probably dropping these other, these other kind of meta tags into the images. I mean, either it's going to have no impact because Google's not even looking out for that information, um, or it's going to have a very minimal impact because it's specifically set aside certain ways for you to, to provide that local information. And also doing good optimization on your site as well, reinforcing mm -hmm. information that you've got in GMB. And I would have thought that Google has already got ample local signals for them to really understand about your location. So you're not boosting anything else, you're not boosting uh, you know, your authority uh, or your relevance by adding in that. So it's really just around your location. Yeah, well, and the other thing too is I always think of how spammable is this tactic, right? So something like that is very spammable, which means I think it would have little authority. And I think that is something where even if it does have a boost right now, it's not gonna be a long-term thing because it's way too easy for someone to spam the heck out of photos by adding all that EXIF data and just going crazy with it. So those kinds of situations is like, that's far too spammable. I don't think it'll hang on. Whereas something mm -hmm. like getting reviews from people who physically have been at your location, that's something that we know for sure that Google checks. And yeah, that's not very spammable because it's really hard to set up a whole bunch of cell phones to pretend that you're actually at a location that look like they're real people and then leave reviews for that location, for example. Yeah, yeah, I would, uh, I would, I would agree that it's, um, it may potentially have a small amount of impact, but its impact is only ever going to be small, and there are probably better places to be allocating your effort and resource and budget uh, mm -hmm. to uh, to have an have an impact. Yeah. Uh, okay, uh, let's see if anything else has been voted up on the uh, questions yet. Uh, not yet, so we're just going to keep working our way down then. Uh, this come a question comes from uh, Zane Tuck. We have a client in the mental health vertical. Uh, they want to try and get organic rankings for broad keywords like psychiatrist, counseling, psychiatry. Those are especially tough keywords. There are lots of directories yeah. taking the bulk of the organic spots. So we're talking really organic here. Uh, any tips? I think that you realistically have to think, can I actually beat these directories? And that's a tough conversation to have. We actually have a psychiatrist client who early in the relationship asked us the same question, like psychology today is always coming up. How can I beat them? Well, you have to be like psychology today, you know, which is not gonna happen. 
And I think there's just some directory listings that are so authoritative in that vertical that there's just no possible way that you can disrupt them. Like Yelp is a good example uh, for restaurants. Like it's really difficult in North America to beat Yelp when it comes to restaurants or TripAdvisor in Europe when it comes to restaurants. And that's just how it is. So I think that that's where you have to recognize and realize that you're not going to be able to assert these listings. They're just there to stay. So instead, what can you do to be as visible as possible on that particular platform? So go to that directory. Is that how much information are you allowed to give? You know, can you advertise on that site? Like, is that worth giving it a shot to? You know, so what are all the different possible things that you could try? And I think that's the best thing is just really focus on those individual uh, directories, knowing that, you know, if you can't beat them, join them. I think it's called Barnacle SEO. I can't remember who called it yeah. that way back when. Yeah, um, I think it was maybe Mike Blumenthal. But anyway, it's I think that that's something where it's definitely work on that and not just, OK, we need we have a listing. Great. But what can we do to make our listing spectacular? Uh, and I think that's one of the important things to focus on is, you know, people are going to click on those listings or they'll breeze right past them because they're boring. And then maybe you're position eight, but you're the first non-directory position, which means that people are going to click on you more than they would if you were uh, eighth on any other other type of uh, SERP. So yeah. consider that. Yeah. So rather than look at them as competitors. Uh, look at them as new channels to to make use of uh, and to kind of get your listing really optimized. It is called Barnacle SEO. I think it was Will Scott actually who kind Will of coined Scott? the phrase. Yeah, I, mean, I couldn't remember. Right, I mean, it goes that. back to like 2012. It's really old, but it's still I'm around. So right? It's still around. <laughs> um, yeah. Obviously, obviously, you know, those directories can't get listings uh, in the local pack. So make sure mm -hmm. that you're you know getting as much visibility in there as you kind of can do. Um, have they extended? Uh, they probably haven't actually. The service area businesses haven't kind of got into that industry yet, have they? You know, and no. some of the kind of professional service ads, ads as well. Ads? Yeah, yeah they're, they're, they're professional service ads in the US. Um, uh, I and then they're kind of rolling out. Yeah, there's a couple in the States, I think, where you have LSAs, um, not in Canada yet. Uh, LSAs are quite limited here. For our mm. clients in the US, I don't have a client in a vertical that's not like home services that has an LSA unit yet. Um, but I do think that there's a couple that are allowed at this point. Yeah. So I guess the answer would be make sure you're optimizing GMB to the greatest effect because they obviously can't yeah. appear there. If there are LSA or professional service ads, make use of those. And otherwise, see them as a channel to be taken advantage of rather than a competitor to, uh, to, and to, to spend outright. money on Google ads. You know, it's uh, I would say for our psychologist client, actually, they have a really successful Google ads campaign. We do extremely well with conversion rate, even on things like psychologist uh, and those types of generic phrases. So, yeah, I spent some money on okay. ads. <laughs> uh, okay. Um, uh, next question uh, that's, uh, that's come down um, again from online access. Um, uh, what do you feel are the most overlooked metrics in local search? Um, I wonder whether that's kind of a, maybe we can find out whether that's kind of reporting metrics or tactics. Um, but maybe we'll ask the, the second part of that question first. Um, any kind of mistakes um, that you see businesses or SEOs repeating over and over again? Um, Maybe it's a genuine mistake, or maybe it's sort of putting their faith in a tactic that actually just doesn't deliver. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think I would say that people definitely focus a lot on tactics that are kind of old. Like this is stuff that's worked before, so we're going to keep doing it. And actually, there was a question that I saw go up the chat earlier about um, when I was talking earlier about having, you know, combinations of, say, electrical in city name, electrical in city name. And you have like 80 different pages about how you do electrical service in that city. And I said it's not necessary anymore. And that's a tactic that I still see people do all the time. I mean, the thing is, is that you really have to think about it from a perspective of the crawler. What are they actually going to pay attention to, right? Like you're shouting at it that you have 600 different pages that you really want them to all rank. Like you have to pick your battles. And I think that that's something where it's really difficult for people to decide how to pick their battles and, and set, you know, here's our priorities. Um, so don't don't try to get 600 pages to rank. Just get six to rank. You know, I'd rather have six pages ranking really great than 600 pages ranking media barely at all. You know, might as well be dead if you're on page two, right? So I think that that's something to think about. And then uh, the other mistake too that I see SEOs make is really thinking about it in terms of the volume of content, which is important in local SEO, right? Local SEO is like how SEO was back in 2005. The more you can write, the better. And that's still important, but then you need to look at the content and you need to look at it on a mobile device and then you have to decide if it's compelling or not. Like put a heading in there, use some bullets, add an image. It wouldn't kill you to make some paragraphs and not have this giant wall of text, right? So I think that's where uh, I really would encourage local SEOs to get off their desktop computers, 
I say this looking at a laptop right now with a double screen just out of view on my mm -hmm. right here, but use your mobile device more often. And I think that's one of the most important things is if you really look at the number of people coming onto people's websites and you see that you know 80% of the visitors are mobile, stop looking at desktop first because you're not mimicking what that searcher's actual experience is. And yeah, and they're gonna have a crappy, you know, 4G connection on an old iPhone. Is your site fast, you know? And is that something that you could work on, for example, instead of writing yet another page about how you provide, you know, electrical services in this tiny little suburb that where you have eight potential clients that could come from there, for example. Uh, and yeah, and just to know how about there was a, when Dan Leveson, we had him on last week, we had a, a big section talking about, you know, kind of creating kind of content for different locations and service areas. And he had some really, really good advice, actually. So um, mm -hmm. if that's a particular kind of question that you've got, you could look at the recording from that from last week. It's on the Bright Local blog. Uh, we went into this particular question for around 10 minutes, actually. So some really good uh, advice there and how to kind of structure um, kind of content around kind of each individual kind of location. And he talked a little bit about, you know, what was too much and what was too little and how you can kind of test the, the kind of the, kind of, um, the range between uh, between those two. Um, so you focus a lot on content there, both in terms of the number of pages and actually the, then the raw kind of word volume uh, on each page. Yeah, people, I think people, people, go, people do too much. Yeah, and I mean, make it readable too. We actually have a blog post on our website uh, about how line length and text size is really important when it comes to making websites usable. It isn't just, because uh, the other thing too is think about the age of people who are visiting your site. Maybe their eyesight isn't so great anymore. I mean, as I get into my 40s, you know, I definitely do the thing with the arm extenders where I have to like hold stuff out before I can read it sometimes. And don't make the text on your website so tiny. Make sure it has good contrast, right? It's little stuff like that that really makes a difference. And you're not necessarily going to notice it until you look at the site, not just by using uh, dev tools on your computer and mimicking an iPhone, but actually get an old iPhone and look at the website on it and realize, wow, this is a really horrible experience. Um, we had a great example with a client. We used uh, Full Story. There's also Hotjar and Crazy Egg, lots of different tools like that. I would say Hotjar and Full Story are my two favorites, where we saw that there was a problem where their chat was overlaying their main CTA. And so people on mobile devices couldn't actually contact them and you could see them like trying to tap on that thing to contact them but they couldn't because the chat was in the way and the chat was a bot it wasn't a human being so they didn't want to use the chat and so they're literally turning away business because they hadn't really sign significantly tested their site on a mobile device and it's stuff like that like spend your time doing that instead of thinking about you know oh well i need to make this extra page for something like fix what you already have before you move on to new stuff yeah Great advice that actually, rather than focusing pure on visibility, focus on maximizing the traffic you're already getting. Okay, mm -hmm. uh, next question uh, down. Um, Stephen asked a question about any insights on Google suspending reviews. I've seen that being answered in uh, the chat anyway, and I know Mike Blumenthal has um, kind of uh, tweeted about it today that Google is now allowing reviews to be responded to. I'm not sure mm -hmm. it's, it's a full rollout yet. It was talked about, you know, a rollout kind of across countries uh, or yeah. across different kind of industries, uh, but they're still not allowing new reviews to be written. Um, so anyway, I think you'll find the kind of answer to that in the kind of chat theme. So for the sake of time, I will jump on. Uh, next question um, uh, comes from Liz. Uh, it says, just noticed there are two new fields uh, in GMB, uh, COVID info link uh, and a telehealth info link. Um, mm -hmm. The edits are being taken, but the information cannot be found on the listing. So I think, you know, you can submit these details, but they're not exhibiting anywhere. Any reason yeah. why you think this might be? Um, I think there was actually an announcement about it yesterday that they're going to start allowing these links on practitioner listings. So, for example, doctors and medical uh, type authorities. So I think that those are the, those are what those fields are. They might have them in the back end, but not presentation for the front end yet. But if you have those fields and I don't think every business does. If you have those fields, then definitely fill them in because they will show up at some point. Um, and I'm fairly sure there was some discussion yesterday on Twitter uh, about these fields showing up and uh, people are yeah. talking about it. OK, so essentially Google has sort of part rolled out the solution for this. Uh, yeah. It's in the dashboard, but not necessarily exhibiting on the front end for, for users yet. Yeah. So if you don't have those links, like work on it now and get those links in there uh, so that you can have them ready when Google does put them out in the front end. OK, uh, I guess the next question comes from uh, Tricia with COVID-19. Uh, there are a lot of limitations on what could be done. I've got a listing that just moved in the middle of this. Um, bad luck, Tricia, that sounds like really tough timing. Um, mm -hmm. Should I wait a little so it doesn't become unverified to update the address? Um, 
I've added a post to note it so that she's, I guess, alerted that, it, that it's changed. Um, um, because obviously she's not there to get to pick up the post, the, you know, the kind of postcard for the draft. So should she just leave it as is, or um, you know, do you think Google will handle it and, and be more generous in terms of the time you've got to, to respond to verification? Yeah, I mean, I think Google probably will be generous in the time you have to respond to verification. You might just have to leave it. Um, I would also, I know you said you put in a post, I would also edit the business description as well. I know people don't read that a ton, but it is visible, uh, especially the beginning of it. So I would edit that to include that information as well. I think it's just yeah, terrible yeah. timing. Yeah, I think it's just bad timing and I think you just have to wait it out. Um, it might be worthwhile contacting GMB support. I know that they're totally slammed right now, but at least to get it on the radar. Um, and you didn't mention what vertical the client's in, but uh, if it isn't something health related, then you probably are gonna have to wait, unfortunately, until things have calmed down. Are they prioritizing sort of health related verticals then in terms of- They did say that, yeah. In? Yeah, yeah, they did okay. say they were prioritizing. I think I think they're reviewing all questions because they don't necessarily know, obviously, when you come in, what it is that you do, but once they see your GMB, then they're prioritizing you based on that. Right. Okay. They're a restaurant. Ugh. Yeah. I don't know, Trisha. Oh, that sucks too for a restaurant to have to move right now. That's horrible timing. I feel for them. Yeah. Um, yeah. That's something where I would try contacting GMB and see if they can help you at all. Um, and if they're are the, if they're doing curbside pickup, yeah, they haven't replied to anything in a month. Try mm. the forum as well uh, and see if you can send a flag up at least. Um, I know that there's some moderators that. Uh, who can maybe flag stuff but again like they're so busy with everything else that's going on like i don't know if they're gonna talk to they're gonna be able to talk to them um oh and trisha just said in chat landlord sold the old building okay so what i would recommend in that case is get if your if your area allows those uh mobile signs that you can like put on wheels outside the business like just get a mobile billboard that's like such and such business isn't here anymore they're over at this address now because if the landlord sold the old building then you probably don't have a this business has moved sign on it uh, so I would just buy a mobile billboard if you can um, to push people to the new location. Uh, okay, we haven't got long left. So we've actually have answered a couple of the questions kind of going down uh, already. Uh, I guess one question was just a kind of clarification. You mentioned that creating service plus city pages is no longer necessary. Um, which I don't think you quite said those words actually. Um, but you know, do you see their effectiveness waning or is it just the way people approach them? Yeah, I I think I do see their effectiveness waning. And I realistically think it's because you've got the same old crap on 200 pages and Google's just not interested in it. And I think realistically, can you uniquely write about the electrical services you provide in every single suburb of every single location? And then you're gonna do the same thing again when it comes to plumbing. And then you're gonna do the same thing again when it comes to HVAC. Like realistically, there's only so much interesting stuff you can put. And then it just feels like you're just spamming words out there to rank better. Instead, focus on a few pages and how you can make those few pages great. Um, and also, you know, if you're struggling with ranking uh, links, I, I feel like people turn to link building last because, yeah, it's super hard and difficult to do, but link building is extremely effective. And if you find that you're struggling with getting links in your area, this is where you return to things like sponsorships, for example. Um, one of our clients, for example, they're doing a really great thing right now. This client is very inventive. We did not tell them to do this. They came up with it on their own, but they're a convention center and obviously no conventions happening right now. So what they're doing is creating Spotify playlists of the set lists of the bands that have played at their place over the past year and they're putting it on Spotify. It's like, that is so smart. And yeah, just try to think outside the box in terms of what you can share that uh, will get you links or mentions or people sharing you or, you know, what can you do to that's going to be interesting other than yet another location service combination page. Do you, do you guys build quite a lot of links? Obviously, you're quite a small, uh, quite a sort of small agency mm -hmm. uh, and link yeah. building is, 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 is a very time intensive task. Mm -hmm. um, but is it something that you, you prioritize as part of your actions for most clients? We do link building for some clients, for sure. Um, some other clients, we actually teach them how to do link building, uh, and then they do it themselves. Again, like if they have an in-house team, then we'll teach their team how to do link building, because it's always best if a link building request comes from the actual company and not just like, hi, I'm from this marketing company. We're totally not asking yeah. for this link for marketing purposes. you know. And sometimes, yeah. too, it's like, uh, media links can be really effective or at least media mentions. And so in that case, it's talking to clients. Uh, we have a client who um, they manufacture circuit boards and they're considered an essential business because they're making circuit boards for uh, medical devices. And they were like, I don't know what we're gonna do to promote ourselves right now. I'm like, you should call the media and tell them you're making circuit boards for medical devices. And they did, and they got a couple articles 
out of it almost immediately. Yeah. So it's stuff like that where you just have to think, you know, I have this thing, don't think of it as a limitation, think of it as a feature. And how can you promote this um, and just let people know that this is what you're doing? Do you have a, um, do you have a sort of a kind of hierarchy of, of the ways you try and focus your, your kind of link building so that you've got a set set of tactics and you like to use them in a, in a, in a sort of certain order, starting with maybe the, the kind of easiest or, you know, the kind of quickest sort mm -hmm. of ROI um, or ones that, that you, uh, that are always the most effective in terms of the actual value that they add to the, the kind of link profile. Yeah, I mean, part of it does depend on each individual client. Like, is the client a good writer? Then we might want to consider things like writing, I mean, guest posts. I mean, people say, oh, guest posts don't work. But if you write a post for someone else's website and they link to you, like, I'm sorry, that works, you know? Or can they write an ebook as something that you're going to give away because that also gets links? Or if that's not something that they do, you know, scholarships, for example, right? So I think it really depends on each individual client and what their appetite is and what their personality is, because you really don't want to force a client who hates doing video to do videos for example, right, or is really bad at video, or they're a poor writer, and it's going to take tons of your time. So do try to consider each client's personality and the types of tactics that you recommend for them. Um, and some clients for link building, sometimes it's, you know, if you look at, say, uh, Ahrefs, for example, is one of the tools we use for SEO work. And Ahrefs has this really nice link intersect where you can put in your competitor's domains and your domain, it'll tell you sites that link to your competitors and not to you. If you do that and you find that your competitors have some really sweet links, like that's where, okay, link building is obviously something we're gonna have to look at. Look at those types of links. That's probably gonna lead you on an exploration of the type of links that you can get as well. Uh, and sometimes they haven't bothered with any links at all. So then you know, okay, so I just need to get a few and then I'm gonna be better than these guys. Uh, so I think that's really where that competitive research can also come in. Okay, great. Um, Dana, we've overrun, but would you mind hanging on for 10 minutes and just asking a few more oh, questions? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, brilliant. Um, next question comes from Bruce, and I know Bruce submitted this in advance, so uh, I want to make sure we get this answered. Sorry, Bruce, that it's taken so long to come around to it. Um, Bruce's question is, um, my agents specialize in specific neighborhoods. We create blogs, drone videos, neighborhood highlight videos, social media marketing, highlighting the neighborhood and why you'd want to live there. So this is, I guess, for realtors. Um, mm -hmm. Most of the marketing is bat links to the neighborhood uh, sort of website page. Um, mm -hmm. What else can they do to get recognized as kind of local neighborhood experts? Um, it says by buyers and sellers. So I wonder whether this is not looking from a search point of view, but maybe just from a kind of an overall kind of credibility authority perspective. Um, yeah. Anything you think they should be, could be doing to really reaffirm um, their, um, their kind yeah. of expertise? I would start with neighborhood guides, see if anyone has built these. Uh, and if they have, maybe you can sponsor it or something like that. Like if, if you Google, you know, best restaurants in neighborhood name and it's not Yelp, you know, for example, as the site has come up, then what can you do to help that site? Um, and really think about it too. Like people choose obviously neighborhoods when they're choosing where they wanna live. And if you live in a city that's big enough to have those kinds of neighborhoods and people are saying, I want to live in, so for example, in Edmonton here, like I want to live in Highlands. Okay, so if I Google that and I find a directory from a realtor and they demonstrate that knowledge of Highlands, then of course I'm going to contact them, right? And I think that that's where you really have to have those kinds of guides to help bring people in. And there's certainly lots of good opportunities right now too, even in building a list of, um, there's a great spreadsheet flying around Edmonton right now that somebody made a Google doc uh, of all the restaurants that are doing takeout and delivery. And all it is is a spreadsheet with all their information and whether or not they're doing takeout delivery when they called to confirm, you know, if you have to order in advance, like all those kinds of details. Mm -hmm. Um, and all they would have to do in here is say, this is brought to you by Bob from reallygreatrealtors.com. And that's it. You know, and it doesn't have to be a link building tactic. It's more of an authority building tactic and people are gonna remember stuff like this. So uh, another client of ours, for example, going back to the physiotherapist, um, one thing that's related to physiotherapy is running. And so he, um, you know, sponsored some runs, for example, local runs in the neighborhood. He created a Spotify playlist that you could use while you're running and then made a list of all the great walking trails and running trails in the area that are great for getting outdoors. So consider what you can do for those types of things that really demonstrate your knowledge of the area. Because it's one thing to say, oh yeah, I sell lots of houses in Highlands. And it's another thing to say, you know, Biabella is this great candy store in Highlands. You should go check it out, for example. That's really gonna be the difference. So really those tactics kind of are actually not, they're about kind of old fashioned sort of relationship building and old fashioned PR, mm -hmm. aren't they? It's kind of, yeah. how do you partner up and I guess align yourself with other businesses the way you've got some commonality? that are also big in the kind of local area uh, and just kind of be useful to them and but kind of also kind of piggyback off off their their kind of presence 
uh, and create that opportunity for yourself. Yep. Oh, and I found in the chat, somebody found the spreadsheet. So great. Yeah. And I think it's things like that where mm -hmm. whoever Dan Clapson is like, good job, Dan, on making this list of stuff. You know, that's the kind of opportunity. And maybe you're not going to be first past the post, right? Maybe somebody else already got to it. But can you build on that? Can you engage with it? Or if you if they've created an excellent resource, can you build a relationship with that person who created the excellent resource? Uh, hopefully they're not also a realtor and work with them, for example, you know, and those are the, how those kinds of relationships are built. And, you know, as much as people Google stuff, like if, if, if somebody said to them, you need to contact Bob Electrical, he is going to you know, give, do you a great job versus someone saying, oh, you know what? No, I'm going to go to Google instead of using my best friend's recommendation on what electrician to choose. Like, they're not going to do that. So often it is that word of mouth that makes a difference. And that's where you got to get off the computer and actually go talk to people, maybe not in person from a distance, you know, or by the phone <laughs> right now. But yeah, talk to people and get to know the neighborhood and make sure the neighborhood knows you. And that's going to make a difference. Uh, okay, brilliant. Uh, thank you, Jen. Next question. This is about service area businesses for two offices in neighboring towns, both are GMB listings. Um, since they don't serve customers uh, at the offices, um, the workers' residences were changed. Uh, we changed these both to SAB uh, yep. with unique yep. zip code for each one. In mm -hmm. your opinion, does it make sense to have two GMB listings uh, or to have one and kind of combine the service areas? So you've got essentially very, very potentially one more powerful GMB listing uh, or two that serve specific um, uh, zip codes and, and catchment areas. I think it depends on how far away these places are. Um, that would be a question where I would definitely need more information. If it's two neighborhoods in the same city, then I would say just make one GMB. But if it's two where you're actually in different places um, and also consider, you know, do people travel between the two places? So for example, you can consider a place like Dallas, which is enormous and really spread out, but people are willing to travel to go to different places in Dallas. So if you have somebody in say Richardson, for example, versus Dallas proper, you know, is that, does that make sense to have the two listings? Probably not, you know, but if you're in Dallas and say Austin, well, yeah, of course it's going to make sense to have two different listings um, because they are two different places geographically and in terms of searcher intent. People are going to hire a company from Dallas when they want a company in Austin. So I think need more information on that, but, but consider that geography uh, when you're thinking about what to do. Uh, okay, great. Uh, hopefully Jeff, that gives you uh, some food for thought. Um, I guess another question that's got from online access. Uh, actually, I think we've watched a couple of your questions. I might just jump on to the next question. Apologies uh, for that. Um, this is from Emma Russell. Uh, do you have any particular opinions on Yext? Um, you know, uh, does it negatively impact speed? Not quite sure what she means by that. And you know, um, you know, how would you, you know, how do you look at Yext? Do you ever use them? When do you not use them? You know, what alternatives do you go to? Yeah. Um, OK, so Yext is tricky. I get that if you're with a very large organization, sometimes it can be useful to manage citations. Um, we found data quality issues with Yext, unfortunately. Um, and in Canada, actually, in particular, uh, Yext is a partner with Yellow Pages. And if you live in Canada, you know that Yellow Pages is the worst. And they have huge problems where Yellow Pages will sign you up for a contract. They use Yext, and then you cancel with Yellow Pages if you can. This is the problem with Yellow Pages. They don't let you cancel. Uh, if you can cancel with them, but then Yext continues on, so we can never update your citations ever. So it can be really iffy from that perspective. They're not my favorite, for sure. Um, and for the speed thing, I think, is there like an embed thing that Yext does or something like that? That might be what they're talking about when it comes to speed. Um, and but I'm not 100% sure what it, what you mean by X and speed. So yeah, I mean it's not my favorite. I think there's other solutions out there, but also you have to consider your own specific situation. You know, is X actually the best fit for you? I know they're one of the cheaper large scale data aggregators, which is why people choose them. Yeah, I don't think they're necessarily that cheap actually. When you when you kind of look at them, I think they charge a fairly yeah. premium. I mean, we've got some quite good um, cost comparisons uh, that you know they, none of these things are like for like they're never apples for apples, but we've got some quite mm -hmm. good cost comparisons on our site that look at the kind of cost and what you pay for each uh, for each one. I mean, obviously, we're naturally very biased. We do a lot of citation building and you know, yeah. up against the YEX lots. But I think I would agree with you. For, for full disclosure, I would say sometimes it just makes sense to use YEX, particularly when you're working at scale uh, and you've got the need to update um, you know, listing data on a regular basis. That's when uh, it's worth paying for. Um, yeah. But don't expect it to be perfect. Um, don't expect it to be always right. Expect that they are you're going to have to, at some point, you know, extricate yourself from the relationship, unpick 
you know, those listings, rebuild them potentially again uh, when things revert back to kind of a pre yext state. Yeah, well, that's the problem um, is that, yeah, if you cancel yext, everything goes away. Um, and we've also seen situations where clients have put UTMs on their URLs from Google My Business and yext keeps overwriting them with non-UTM URLs. So there's definitely some data issues with yext too. So just make sure you're aware before you get into that relationship on what all the downsides are. Yeah, I say sometimes it is the obvious choice, uh, one mm -hmm. of those sort of solutions, because you've just got such scale, you want to solve the problem quite quickly and, and sort of move on. Um, but in many cases, I think, you know, I guess, obviously, don't expect it to be perfect. Uh, it's great in certain scenarios, but can end up creating kind of more problems and difficulties for you down the line. Uh, and that's probably the way you should be looking at it. You know, I'll ask Jamie and Steph to kind of share some of that kind of cost comparison stuff to you that might you might find that uh, useful. Okay, mm -hmm. uh, Brandon's question. Uh, let's see if we can get uh, one more in after this. Um, mm -hmm. I've got a law firm who has two separate uh, uh, sites. Each site focuses on a separate type of law. They have four locations mm -hmm. and are trying to rank locally for all four locations for both sites, but the firm name is the same. Okay, so mm -hmm. uh, a law firm yeah. has two separate websites. Uh, okay, so they, again, they've got different specializations, different websites geared to each one, um, but also they have four physical locations. Yeah. That's tricky. I would ask you how different are those areas of law that you can't put them all in a single site? Maybe this is how you've done things for a long time because back in the day, it used to be great to have edmontoncriminallawyer.com and edmontoncivillawyer.com, for example, right? I don't think that's necessary necessarily anymore. Google can't understand that. So I think really consider like how different are these types of law. Um, I get that in some verticals, for example, like DUI law, for example, we have a client who's a criminal lawyer. DUI is one of their most competitive keywords. Uh, and the person who beats them is edmontonduilaw.com, which is okay, fine. <laughs> We're just going to accept that they're going to beat them, right? And that, that's fine. They could be number two. And they're going to come across as more uh, authoritative um, because they've argued at the Supreme Court and stuff like that, right? Like they come across as a better lawyer than Edmonton DUI lawyer or whatever their website is. So I think that that's something where you really need to think like, do I still need to have these two separate listings? Is Are these areas of law really completely different? Um, an example I can think of is if you do family law and criminal law. Uh, and in that case, you might actually want to think about having a different name for the other half of the business, um, because maybe it makes sense to go by initials for one half uh, or oh, personal injury and medical malpractice. Those feel real close. Um, hmm. I mean, Brandon, I think if they were my client, I would seriously look at if I should combine them all into a single site. I get that they both rank organically. It's not impossible to make sites, to combine sites and have them rank organically afterwards. Like it just means you have to be really good with your website development, really good at your technical SEO and have a really solid migration, but it's not impossible to do that. And I feel like it's less work than trying to rank two sites where you have to do the same thing twice for all these different sites. Uh, and those two, the personal injury medical malpractice do feel close enough that I feel like you should be having them on a single site because um, some personal injury lawsuits are actually medical malpractice lawsuits. So, um, okay, brilliant. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Jenna. Uh, we, we've held on to you for a quarter of an hour longer than we planned.